1859, there was such an intense solar storm, known as the Carrington Event, that it caused malfunctions in telegraph lines worldwide. Accompanied by this storm was an aurora borealis visible as far south as Rome, a phenomenon that seems unimaginable today. The Carrington event reminds us of the close relationship between Earth's magnetic field and that of our star, and it is from this relationship that the auroras are born. It is important to note that auroras do not occur only in the northern hemisphere, but also in the southern hemisphere, around the south pole, and generally around the poles of any planet with a magnetic field. If you find this topic fascinating, stay tuned to this video because today we are talking about polar auroras, a story that begins inside our star. The sun is a star, a cluster of plasma at extremely high temperatures and pressures, where nuclear reactions counteract gravitational collapse with their energy. Occasionally, plasma flows, known as solar winds, consisting mostly of protons, electrons, and alpha particles, detach from the sun and are launched at hundreds of kilometers per second into interplanetary space. These winds are potentially very harmful to living organisms, but among other things, it is the solar winds that make the aurora borealis possible through interaction with our planet's magnetic field. The movement of fluids inside a hot planet like Earth creates a planetary magnetic field that governs the movement of charged particles within it, acting as a shield that protects us from solar winds. The magnetic field can be schematized with so-called field lines, imaginary lines representing the direction of the force that charged particles experience. The field lines connect the North Pole to the South Pole like a giant donut wrapping around the planet. The solar winds, also governed by magnetic forces, modify the structure of Earth's magnetic field on the day side of the Earth, the side facing the sun, compressing the magnetic field while on the night side the field elongates, forming the so-called magnetic tail. Intense enough solar winds can give rise to the phenomenon of magnetic reconnection, a process in which Earth's magnetic field lines and those of the solar wind join together. When this happens, particles enter the planetary magnetic field and spiral around the field lines, bouncing between the north and south poles and the so-called Van Allen belts. The magnetic field lines intersect Earth's atmosphere at high latitudes, and when stronger-than-usual solar winds arrive, charged particles can reach Earth's atmosphere, typically between 10 and 20 degrees of latitude from the pole, both north and south, at any time of day. This is how polar auroras form. When solar wind particles collide with atmospheric ones, energy transfer occurs, resulting in the formation of the aurora borealis. Atmospheric particles can become excited, increasing the energy of their electrons or become ionized, losing electrons. After this, excited particles lose energy and ionized ones capture stray electrons, emitting light in the form of luminous radiation. This light gives shape to the aurora borealis, with colors ranging from purple to red to green, depending on the energy and type of atmospheric particles involved. Oxygen, for example, emits yellow-green or orange-red light, while nitrogen, the most common molecule in the atmosphere, can emit blue or purple light when ionized, or red when excited. Altitude also plays a role in determining the color of the aurora as air density varies with distance from the Earth's surface. Polar auroras are not exclusive to Earth. They have been observed on all planets in the solar system with a magnetic field, and even on a comet, 67P churyumov gerasimenko Jupiter's auroras, for example, are among the most fascinating. Unlike those on Earth, which are only observed during periods of strong solar activity, Jupiter's auroras are permanent and primarily visible in the infrared and ultraviolet. The Jovian aurora is only partially triggered by the solar wind. Most of the charged particles come from its major moons, especially Io, which emits a large amount of charged particles through its intense volcanic activity. These form a sort of corona around the planet, the so-called magnetodisc, which greatly enhances Jupiter's magnetic field. This disc is the source of the charges that form the main oval of the Jovian aurora. Other sources of aurora overlap with this oval, such as auroral footprints, bright spots linked to the magnetic field of the moons, and bright arcs formed by the charges accumulated in the planet's magnetic tail. Saturn, despite being a gas giant like Jupiter, has auroras similar to those on Earth, resulting from the interaction between the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere. The auroras of Uranus and Neptune are less known, but the Hubble Space Telescope observed auroral phenomena on Uranus between 2011 and 2014, while observations by Voyager 2 detected weak auroral emissions on both planets in the 1980s. 
Mars and Venus, despite lacking a planetary magnetic field, exhibit auroral phenomena, likely related to magnetic reconnection processes induced by the solar wind. On Mars, auroras have been observed in the ultraviolet and seem to be linked to local magnetic anomalies. The Rosetta probe observed something similar to an aurora on Comet 67P, visible only in the ultraviolet, caused by the interaction between solar winds and water in the comet's coma. And that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know in the comments if you liked it. Leave a like to support us and subscribe to the channel.